Major depression impacts 5% of the population. That is an enormous number. That means if you're in a class of 100 people, five of them are dealing with major depression or have at some point. Look around you in any environment and you can be sure that a good portion of the people that you're surrounded by is impacted by depression or will be at some point. So this is something we really have to take seriously and that we want to understand. So let's talk about depression the way that clinicians talk about depression. Because one of the issues is that we use the word depression loosely. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm so depressed. I didn't get this job or I'm so depressed. I just, I don't know, I had a really rough week or I'm exhausted. I'm so depressed or I'm so depressed. I thought I was going to go on vacation and then they canceled the flight. Okay. That is not clinical depression. Now that person might be depressed, but clinical depression actually has some very specific criteria. First of all, there tends to be a lot of grief. There tends to be a lot of sadness. That's no surprise. The threshold to cry is often a signature of depression. Now that doesn't mean that if you cry easily that you're depressed. Some people cry more easily than others. But if you're somebody who typically didn't cry easily and suddenly you find yourself crying very easily, that could be a sign of depression. And I want to emphasize could. There's also this thing that we call anhedonia, a general lack of ability to enjoy things, things that typically or previously we enjoyed, things like food, things like sex, things like exercise, things like social gatherings, a kind of lack of enjoyment from those things. And that's a common symptom of major depression. The other one is guilt. Oftentimes people with depression will feel very guilty about things they have done in the past, or they'll just generally feel badly about themselves. Sometimes even delusional thinking, negative delusional thinking, and in particular, anti-self confabulation. What is anti-self confabulation? Well, first of all, confabulation is an incredible aspect of our mind and our nervous system where the confabulations are not directly or completely linked to reality, but they are ones that make the self, the person describing them, seem sick or in some way not well. A good example would be somebody who experiences a physical injury, perhaps. Maybe they break their ankle, maybe it's an athlete, and they also happen to become depressed. And you'll talk to them, you say, how are things going? How's your rehab? And they'll go, oh, it's okay. And I don't know, I'm just, I feel like I'm getting weaker and weaker by the day. I'm just not performing well. And then you'll talk to the person that they're working with and they'll say, no, they're actually really improving. And I tell them they're improving, but somehow they're not, they're not seeing that improvement. They're not registering that improvement. You'll say, I actually heard you're doing much better. You're getting better. You're taking multiple trips around the building now before you could barely get out of bed. And they'll say, yeah, well, basically, you know, they changed some things about the, about the parking lot that make it easier to move around. So it's not really me. And these aren't people that are just explaining away their, you know, their accomplishments because they're, they're trying to, you know, brush off praise. They are viewing themselves and they are confabulating according to a view that is very self deprecating to the point where it doesn't match up with reality. The other common symptomology of major depression is what they call vegetative symptoms. Vegetative symptoms are symptoms that occur without any thinking, without any doing, or without any confabulation. These are things that are related to our core physiology. It actually relates to a system in the body that nowadays is more commonly called the autonomic nervous system. And it relates to things like the stress response or to our ability to sleep. So vegetative symptoms be things like constantly being exhausted. And one of the most common symptoms of people with major depression, one of the signs of major depression is early waking and not being able to fall back asleep despite being exhausted. So let's talk about hormones. 20% of people that have major depression have low thyroid hormone, and that leads to low energy, low metabolism in the brain and body. So there are certain situations or conditions that can impact the thyroid hormone system and make people more susceptible to depression or make a pre-existing depression worse. More stress is correlated with more bouts of major depression across the lifespan. How many bouts? Well, it turns out that as you go from having one to two to three, well, when you hit four to five bouts of really intense depression, stressful episodes in life, these tend to be long-term stressful episodes, your risk for major depression goes way up. But when we are stressed, chronically stressed, 
we get inflamed, our brain and various locations in the brain become inflamed because certain classes of cells, in particular those glial cells, those cells and their biochemistry and their dialogue with the neurons of the brain and body starts to become disrupted. Well, there is a set of actions that we can take in order to limit inflammation and to relieve some, and in some cases, all of the symptoms of major depression. One of those approaches is to increase our intake of so-called EPAs or essential fatty acids. When people ingest a certain level of EPA omega-3 fatty acids, the relief from depressive symptoms matches the SSRIs. That's incredible, right? That essential fatty acids could relieve symptoms of depression as well as some of the prescription antidepressants. However, it does seem that if you take a gram, a thousand milligrams or 2000 milligrams of EPA, there does seem to be some substantial relief for many people in major depressive symptoms. Exercise, the activation of the muscles through rhythmic repeated use, in particular aerobic exercise, but also resistance training has been shown to do this to some extent. I think we all know that we should be getting anywhere from 150 minutes to 180 minutes per week of so-called zone two cardio for cardiovascular effects. Zone two is the kind of mellow-ish cardio where you can sort of hold a conversation if you needed to, but it's a little bit tough. You're kind of sucking for air a little bit. And that's going to limit these depressive-like symptoms. I think in all of us, I don't think that we should think of depression as a strict threshold. So you've got multiple steps here. We're describing two tools, increasing EPA and regular exercise as a way of increasing serotonin somewhat indirectly, right? It's by limiting this bad pathway to promote the activity of a good pathway. Now I want to talk about something that, at least for me, was quite surprising when I first learned about it for sake of treatment of mood disorders, and that's creatine. For those of you that are into resistance training, and actually for those of you that are into endurance training as well, creatine has achieved a lot of popularity in recent years because supplementation with creatine can draw more water into muscles and can increase power output from muscles. Creatine supplementation doesn't just have these positive effects on physical performance, but can also be used as a way to increase mood and to improve the symptoms of major depression. Basically, what's been observed is that increasing the activity of the phosphocreatine system in the forebrain can be beneficial or at least is correlated with improvements in mood. One of the most common questions I get is about different diets, different regimes, different nutritional plans, things like keto. The ketogenic diet has been explored for its ability to relieve certain symptoms of depression, in particular to what's called maintain euthymia. Euthymia is the kind of state of equilibrium between a manic episode and a depressive episode in a manic bipolar person. Basically, manics have highs and they have lows. Bipolars either cycle back and forth really quickly. So really quickly can be day to day. Other people, it's month to month or week to week. They're going highs and lows. And you hear about mania and you hear about dysphoria. Euthymia is that kind of place in the middle where people feel neither too high nor too low. And there are some interesting studies looking at the ketogenic diet for maintaining euthymia in manic depressives, but also in people with major depressive disorder. Why would this work? The ketogenic diet, by way of increasing ketone metabolism or shifting brain's metabolism over to ketones, tends to modulate GABA such that GABA is more active and adjust this so-called GABA glutamate balance. This is getting technical, but glutamate is an excitatory neur neurotransmitter. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and their balance is vital for neuroplasticity, for maintaining healthy levels of activity in the brain, etc. And so there is decent evidence that people with major depressive disorders, in particular, the people with major depressive disorders that are refractory, meaning they don't respond to classical antidepressants, can benefit, it seems, from the ketogenic diet. I'll make one final point about ketogenic diets and GABA and depression, which is that it's also been shown that for people that respond well to these drugs that impact the serotonin system, dopamine system, or norepinephrine, the ketogenic diet there may improve the ability for those drugs to work at lower dosages, which is reminiscent of what we saw with the EPA supplementation.